Hi, Don Forsyth speaking of groups and group decision making. In an earlier presentation we talked about the great promise that groups hold for making excellent, superb, well-informed decisions. They draw in many more minds that can turn an issue over, discuss it, elaborate it, uh, identify issues that never would have occurred to a single individual reviewing a problem. But on the other hand, Groups sometimes do not use their full resources effectively. In some cases, discussion is halting. Uh, the group fails to engage in pre-deliberation efforts, doesn't plan out its process, and groups just like individuals often fall prey to basic decision-making problems, uh, such as taking into account information that's not even relevant, and in some cases, focusing on shared ideas and overlooking key pieces of information that are only known to a few individuals. But the two process, top processes I'd like to discuss in this very brief presentation are, are ones which are unique to group decision making, and they are polarization processes and groupthink. Polarization was recognized as a consequence of making a decision in the 1960s. Prior to that time, it was thought that um, groups tend to be cautious in terms of making a decision. So if you're facing a problem and you want to make sure that uh, the group avoids risk, makes the most judicious, judicious, well-informed, cautious decision, then make it in a group. Uh, don't have individuals make decisions because they could engage in very risky, risky behaviors and risky choices. But researchers, when they compared the decisions made by individuals to the decisions made by groups, they typically found that, in fact, groups make riskier decisions than individuals. That early research was known as the risky shift effect. And it was discovered using a survey such as this one, where individuals were presented with a hypothetical problem and asked to make a choices, choices which vary in risk, and they discovered that in fact, groups, when making these recommendations, shifted in the direction of riskier alternatives, not more cautious alternatives. So the effect, at least initially, was dubbed the risky shift effect. Subsequent research suggested that groups are not necessarily always riskier. Um, they can sometimes show a cautious shift. So after discussing a problem like this, um, they, in fact, after discussion, tend to choose um, the more cautious alternatives rather than go with these more riskier alternatives. So sometimes they show a risky shift, which is actually more common, but occasionally this more cautious shift could occur as well. Researchers um, investigated this, including David Meyer's investigations, discovered that it's actually a more broad, a broader effect. Uh, yes, caution occurs, risk occurs, but in general there's a polarization tendency that groups through discussion tend to move away from their initial decision towards the polls. So if, for example, you have more individuals within the group whose average opinion strays in the direction of risk, after a discussion a risky shift will occur. If in a group you have more individuals whose average opinions prior to discussion favor caution, after discussion you'll have a cautious shift. This is illustrated in this particular graph uh, in which an investigator um, compared, investigator Dr. Hong, compared the, the decisions of Americans and Chinese. Americans pre-deliberation judgments, um, groups of Americans making judgments strayed in the direction um, strayed, um, favored risk more so than Chinese Americans making deliberations. Chinese Americans, in contrast, tended to favor caution. What you found then, after discussion of, among Americans, was the risky shift. Chinese Americans, after deliberating on the problem, they showed a shift in the direction of caution. So both risky and cautious shifts can occur, but together they're described by a polarization process. Three factors examined in detail in the text identify social comparison processes, persuasion processes, and social identity processes, probably combining to create group polarization. In addition to the tendency to make uh, more risky decisions, or at least more polarized decisions, groups can sometimes display, um, fall prey to a very negative process known as groupthink. 
the case study in this particular chapter talks about John Kennedy's, President John Kennedy's group of advisors who made a series of very critical decisions. Um, one of their decisions was whether or not the United States should support the invasion of Cuba at a location known as the Bay of Pigs. And this decision-making group favored um, sponsoring that invasion and provided military support to it. It turned out to be a very poor decision, in fact. Uh, and as experts examined why such a group of very intelligent individuals, well organized with expert leaders and availability of all kinds of subject matter experts, how could they possibly reach such a bad decision? Um, Irving Janus, in exploring this particular question, suggested that they experienced a very negative decision making process known as groupthink. As Janice discusses this process, he identifies symptoms of groupthink, which if your group displays these symptoms, be wary that the group may experience this very negative form of de decision making. And he also separates those symptoms of groupthink from the actual causes of groupthink. So in terms of, of symptoms, we have overestimation in the group, suggesting your group is just wonderful, that yes, it might make small mistakes, but overall it's, it's invulnerable. And its choices are, of course, the most morally upright ones, a tendency to engage in, engage in collective rationalization and stereotyping of the outgroup, and also strong pressures towards uniformity, and that includes self-censorship, uh, direct pressure on an individual who disagrees with others, the idea that everyone agrees without ever actually taking a formal vote to verify agreement with the case, and also the tendency for certain individuals to take dissenters aside privately and urge them to go along with the group decision. Um, Janice calls those individuals mind guards. Those are all symptoms of group things. They're also symptoms of just simply defective decision making. So it's possible the group will not review its alternatives. It won't engage in, in full deliberation of alternatives and discussion and also show evidence of heuristic based biases in processing information. As for the causes of groupthink, um, there's a number of these, but for example, and the first and most important one is that the group is a cohesive one. Janice is clear about this. Uh, groupthink does not occur in non-cohesive groups. It is one of, one of the few negative aspects of group cohesiveness. We generally think that cohesive groups are more effective than non-cohesive ones, but they are prone, more prone uh, to groupthink in a non-cohesive group. Also, uh, if the group have, might have some stru some structural characteristics that will push it in the direction of groupthink. If, for example, the group is isolated from other groups and, and cannot draw in alternative perspectives, the leader who has a very directive leadership style is a negative aspect, and also a provocative situational kind. If the, if the decision is a very important one, the group is experiencing a high level of stress, uh, it doesn't want to make a poor decision. Ironically, that's when it's more likely to make a poor decision. This is Janice's full model uh, in his analysis of groupthink. We see that cohesiveness combined with structural faults in a provocative situational context will generate this concurrent seeking tendency known as groupthink, where the members of the group will all want to go along with a group decision, even though it might be an ill-considered one. And these are the symptoms uh, displayed by groups. Uh, as they uh, are fallen into the fallen into the negative process of groupthink, uh, alternative models of groupthink, which, which have been suggested, uh, include group centrism. This is just the tendency for many groups to push forward too quickly and not process information so very thoroughly, so they can get closure on issues. Sometimes the desire for closure is even greater than the desire for accuracy. Uh, Barron's analysis of the ubiquity model suggests that groupthink isn't all that rare. That in fact, groups uh, display many of these problems um, as they strive for agreement because of being a, a, a cohesive group, uh, poor leadership behaviors, isolation of the group, the group feels stressed. These are actually very common characteristics in groups, and so actually groupthink is, is quite likely to occur. Fortunately, Janice and other investigators have, have identified ways to minimize groupthink within a group. Um, 
the key is to limit premature concurrence seeking. So a devil's advocate could be appointed in the group, break the larger group into subgroups which discuss and deliberate apart from each other, and reach their own conclusions before you meet in a plenary session and combine those decisions, correct misperception and biases whenever possible, and always use effective decision-making techniques. For more information about groups, and group decision-making, and particular group think, uh, it's examined in a fair amount of detail in Chapter 11. Thank you, as always, for joining me in this presentation.